Hi everyone and welcome to the International Humanistic Management Association's Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn. The International Humanistic Management Association is obviously an international association of people who are concerned with and want to promote humanistic management principles in all its various forms. And we host a variety of topics and formats. Um, we have necessary conversations, PhD network. We have the, the program we're doing now for prof working professionals. Um, we also do conferences and we have uh, pre-conferences at the AOM and other things. So make sure to sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already. And if you like our work, do join and support us. Um, my name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the director of the, our learning partner, Humanist Learning Systems, and my co-host today is Elizabeth Castillo. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Castillo, Assistant Professor of Organizational Leadership at Arizona State University. Welcome. Thank you. And today our guest is Jean Bell, who's with Nonprofit Quarterly. And we reached out to Jean because she wrote an article about moving from extractive work relationships to reciprocal work relationships. And we really liked it and thought, we want to have a conversation about that. How do we do that in the workplace? And this dovetails nicely with our conversation last month, which was about um, flat management, organization self-management. And we mm -hmm. wanted to follow that up with this to talk about um, both the philosophy and the practical how-to. So Jean, welcome. Thank you so much. So can you tell us a little bit about what led you to write that article and a little bit about your own experience with extractive relationships versus reciprocal relationships? Yes. Um, well, I'm a recovering executive director of a nonprofit. <laughs> um, and I had, I had left my job, um, you know, by choice about 10 months ago and, and came to the nonprofit quarterly who I already had a relationship with for the whole time. I was at Compass Point. Um, but it really, that, that departure, that transition, um, I, I don't know how many people on the call have been through this, but when you leave an organization that you love and you leave on purpose, you do... <laughs> end up reflecting on the choices you made and the systems and the culture that you did or didn't create. And for me, um, that was a kind of an emotional process of, of recognizing that as much as we were a value-centered nonprofit organization, a lot of the systems that were in place sort of colluded with mainstream ideas of, of how to treat people and um, and, and primarily, I think, for me, knowing that human resources so often had a risk management orientation. It's sort of geared towards the worst possible scenario instead of 99% of the time, which is these amazing human beings that have chosen to work with you, right? And so I, I was reflective about that. Thankfully, in the last few years of my um, role there, we did begin to really interrogate our human resources processes and, and make some changes. But that, that was pretty late in my tenure and it, it, it gave me a pause as to what are we doing, especially in, in explicitly values-based organizations like nonprofits where I, where I work. That's really interesting. So one of the reasons um, we wanted, to, even though this is for working professionals, you know, more and more as I have conversations with various people in the space, I realize the overlap between like volunteer management and nonprofit management, the principles at play in those organizations and how they might translate to a more for-profit environment. Can you speak on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is, um, you know, and, and we see this, at least the activists that I follow and such and learn from on Twitter, we're not our work, you know, we are not our roles, we are not our productivity, right? And, and a lot of the way we design organizations is to literally, you know, look at the person as a human resource. As I said in the article, I, I made a, a environmental connection, like this, this resource to be completely extracted <laughs> in service of, of the company. And that isn't actually how people function. Um, and the, the irony of it is, is I don't think it gets the productivity that we think it does, you know, I, I really don't. I, I think that um, I wrote down three examples, if you don't mind me sharing just a couple of examples. So I, as I said, I left the organization that I was with for 20 years last year and yesterday I was on a call. 
and still doing a little bit of contract work with them. There was a woman on the call who I swear to God is a different woman than she was a year ago. I, I mean, I said it to her. I said, my God, you, you, you are a different person. You sound different. You, she said, yeah, you know, I've had a kind of a break in my life and I, I grew up, <laughs> you know. The, the fact of the matter is a human resources process that doesn't recognize that when I knew her, she was 25 and searching, and now she's 27 and in a graduate program. Do you know what I mean? A, a system that doesn't recognize who's there and where they are in their life and what, pro, what journey they're on is, is not a good one because it, actually it's not going to keep her or retain her, uh, retain her or develop her. Um, Another example I have is we changed our compensation policy to raise the floor. You know, the, the, the lower paid people were making too little in the Bay Area, a living wage, frankly, is probably $75,000. We raised it to 50, but that, that was what we could do. And I said, there's somebody who's overpaid here in this model. And my board said, well, there's nothing you can do about that. You know, he's been there forever and you know, you can't take things away from people. I said, you know what, I'm gonna ask him. I'm gonna ask him if I could lower his salary because I think he's like, he'll say yes. And he did say yes. And we were able to get our human resources in our compensation policy actually transparent and coherent by asking people, do you believe in this? Can you be part of this, right? So I, I just share these examples to say, this, this system doesn't have to be so um, formal and so disconnected from what are we actually trying to accomplish together? What do we wanna be as an organization? You know that I love that and it's really interesting because on LinkedIn I've been part of a conversation that's been happening about um, about hiring right and mm -hmm. about how salaries are set at the time that people are hired and the interview process which no one wants to disclose how much they made at the previous job and the hiring organization doesn't want to tell you what the salary range is because ultimately the hiring individual is tasked with getting the, re the resource of the person at the cheapest level possible. And it sounds like what you guys did when you raised the floor is you threw that, that model out and said, no, everybody has a minimum, you know, they have to have a living wage. And, you know. But moreover, to your point, and this is a huge point around equity in my opinion, we said explicitly there will be no negotiation in the hiring process. We have a compensation strategy based on the market and, and you know the best we can do, and there will be no negotiation, because you know who wins in those negotiations? You know, typically white men, you know, they, right. they will negotiate their way in and screw up your entire compensation. So there's no negotiation. You print the salary in the job announcement and it's transparent to your organization. That's a huge, huge part of equity for me. And how does how did you find that that impacted the the hiring process and who was coming in and how people felt about the onboarding? I literally think it makes people more comfortable. I mean, I, they're coming into a system that is receiving them transparently, right? I mean, when you when you bring a new person into an organization, there's almost a there can be a threat or a, a confusion about that on both sides, right? And to me, to say, this is our philosophy about compensation. You're coming into this system. You don't have to worry <laughs> about what you're getting paid or what other people make. You know where you are in this, in this place is incredibly comforting. And it, it attracts people <laughs> who have the same values, right? Which is, this is not a game. This isn't about me personally getting as much as I can. And it's not about this organization, as you said, giving you as little as possible. Those are not, that's not the way to start a relationship. Right, and it, and it strikes me too, as we're talking about this, that the whole negotiation of salary is very adversarial at the, just by its very nature, it's adversarial, and that doesn't lead towards the feelings of reciprocity, right? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, we're talking about this at the quarterly right now. This is why I think it's extremely important when you think about reciprocity to disentangle compensation from performance. Uh, you know, I, I think that we spend an ungodly, and you know, I mean, the mainstream is even, many companies have gotten rid of perform, annual performance reviews, et cetera. So this is not a radical thought anymore, but to really, really embrace that if you work here, you're doing the best you can, if you are, if you in fact are, you know, you're in the right job and you're doing the best you can. The idea that we're gonna give you a little bit more money or a little bit less money 
based on a performance review is kind of absurd, right? Um, and that also creates a lot of distrust, I think, in, in the organization and is not a reciprocal process. So to me, compensation is about the market and about the role. <laughs> and this is what it costs, you know? And then performance is about, are you in the right job? Do you have the support you need, et cetera? But so the idea that in so many organizations, so many, I'm sure some on this call, people are making decisions about, you know, a $1,200 raise or an $800, you know, whatever the steps are, based on theoretically some uh, performance review is nonsense to me, absolutely nonsense and not reciprocal. Right. So can let's let's go back and kind of define what a reciprocal work relationship looks like. Like what are the what what does it look like when you have a reciprocal work relationship throughout an organization? Like what are the metrics that we're measuring instead of you know whatever metrics people had? Yeah, Four point two on your performance review, so you got an eight hundred dollar raise. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. For me, where I was coming from in, in writing that piece is who is this person and who is the organization? And we're actually in a relationship. Organizations change, companies change all the time, right? I mean, they're, they're in the process of changing by the very nature of who is attracted to it and who works there, right? So there's literally something happening. I, mean, I believe in organizations or companies as living systems, right? They, they, the oxygen comes from the people who happen to be there and for whatever set of reasons have made a decision to invest their capacity in this place, right? I think we have to take that very seriously, right? At the same time, if that's the case, the, the, the company doesn't exist, it's a, it's a group of people, right? We have to orient ourselves that way, in my opinion, and then we have to figure out, well, what, what is actually driving these people? Why have they chosen this company, or this government, or this nonprofit, and how do we give, give them the space to be their absolute best while they're here, knowing that we're all temporary stewards? They're not gonna be here forever, right? How do we make this a place that they can give their absolute best to? And to me, that means really understanding how adults learn and why they contribute and what they need uh, from a space. Because that's the value. I mean, the value you have as a company or a government or a nonprofit is the degree to which amazing people will give their amazing capacity. That's it. I mean, that's all, that's all you are. <laughs> you know? So is this primarily a philosophic shift on how both the employees and the, and the managers, if that's the way it's set up, relate to one another? Or is it something, um, I don't even know what else it could be, but it's, it's mo we're talking mostly about a philosophic shift, correct? I think so, but the philosophic shift m leads to a different processes and systems and culture, you know, and so I, I think when we, it is philosophical at its core, but it's also truly about effectiveness. I, I mean, if you really think about in your own life, where and when you've given your absolute best performance, I mean, this is what we have to interrogate, right? What were the conditions? What, what support did you have? What intrinsic motivation did you have, et cetera? I doubt very much that it had a lot to do with human resources as we typically think of it. It's that you were in the right place and you, were, you thought you had the support to give your all, right? What does that look like? What, what is the support to give your all? So what are, what are like the practical ways? We talked about salary as a possible way to help like the onboarding and orientation and the, the, the salary part of this as being a process by which you might create more trust um, and therefore more reciprocity. But are there other processes that a, a company could adopt that would help facilitate people working reciprocally as opposed to adversarially or uh, extractively? One of my, for me, one of the key things is not to isolate people from strategy and information. So I think what happens is that um, we pretend that, oh, that's not her job. She doesn't need to know that. Don't give her information that she doesn't have any control over. Um, and so what, what I see happening a lot is people don't have the full picture of the organization and therefore their purpose is not full, right? So this idea somehow that if I'm not, you know, in senior management, I don't need to understand the strategy of the organization. Why? Yes, I do. I mean, everybody needs to understand 
what we're doing, what are our business drivers, what are our metrics, why are we doing this? And what I, th I think happens, a lot of disengagement and a lot of non-reciprocity comes from people not understanding the organization and not, giving not being given access to the why, the purpose, the financial drivers, the, you know, what are our outcomes, et cetera. And so it's not surprising, again, if you just think about what motivates an adult, a human being, regardless of their role, is purpose. And if you're disenfranchised from that purpose because, quote unquote, your position or role isn't responsible for it, that, that starts off a non-reciprocal relationship where you've been sort of cordoned off to a, a place in the organization that isn't full. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, I do. And you just reminded me, I, you know, I used to be in nonprofit management, I used to be a volunteer director. And we had a document that went around called the seven sins of volunteer management. Mm. And number one was not providing your volunteers with an orientation to the purposes and goals of your organization. Right. And even if you just ask someone to sweep the floor, if they don't understand why sweeping the floor is important to the rest of the organization, and it, it absolutely is, you know, then they don't necessarily understand what happens if they fail, right? That there's not a sense of ownership or responsibility. And I think reciprocity is about responsibility, right? Absolutely. And it's about power, right? It's about understanding that everybody needs and has power. And if you actively disenfranchise people from the power over their own performance or their own efficacy in, in the larger system, you're going to get the results, you know, which I, I think it was uh, people treating it as just a job, right? Okay, so I have one more question I want to ask before we open it up to the chat room. So everybody is in the chat room, start asking your questions now. Um, one of the questions we got repeatedly on the, the registration form had to do with how do you create a reciprocal relationship with your supervisor? So the scenario is someone's already been hired, they're working for a boss, the boss may or may not, may be, you know, an extractive boss or a bullying boss or, you know, an adversarial boss and definitely not necessarily a reciprocal boss. So how does someone you know, start that conversation and start moving that upwards. Um, because if you're a manager, you can certainly take this and use this as how you think about your team. But if you're in a team, how mm -hmm. do you do this? And oh. can you? Well, I don't want to be Pollyannish that, you know, there are people that can't be, <laughs> can't be helped, right? So one has to always be looking out for themselves and, and you know, if it can't be done, it can't be done. But I, I think it's about the language, right? And if I, if I frame myself in, in that relationship as somebody who's invested in the purpose of this organization or company, and if I keep coming back to that, how, how am I contributing to the purpose of this company? Um, I th I, my experience is that changes people's, you, you can't respond to that in, in, a, you know, in a way that doesn't acknowledge, oh, you're talking about purpose, you're talking about contribution, you're talking about learning, right? That's the other thing. I mean, to me, it's like contribution and learning. If I'm using that language, I think it, it will at least be startling to somebody who's extractive because the extractive person is assuming that you're trying to get what you, just get what you need. Right. And instead, I'm proposing, what do we need? You know, what is the purpose? How am I contributing to it? And what learning do I need to do to be a better contributor to it? To me, it's about that framing. Now, will all, will all supervisors respond to that? You know, so, I, I can't say 100% they will. But I think that's really different than a performance mindset. Right. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of dignity. You're talking about approaching someone an employer, employee might view as kind of ogreish, <laughs> the ogre manager, right? But yeah. approaching them as a dignified individual that they are, giving them dignity and offering a reciprocal, you as a reciprocal assistant to them, as opposed to and that, I know from experience that that, ha that works magic. <laughs> Yeah. I also think that the, you know, this is, I don't want to appropriate because I'm not an expert, but there's something that I think of as Buddhist about this, which is when I exhibit that I'm not attached to this, I'm temporary, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get something, I'm trying to contribute something. 
um, when I when I exhibit that to somebody who's in power, when I say, while I'm here, I want to make the most significant contribution I could make. What do you think that is? What do I need to learn to do that? I think the while I'm here piece is a way of ceding power to people who like power, right? So I think there's something strategic about that, which is to say, I'm not trying to get your job or, you know, I'm not trying to, while I'm here, because we're all temporary, what is the highest value I could contribute? I think that's, you know, a strategic thing to say to somebody. Excellent, that's really cool. Elizabeth, um, do you have any questions or do you wanna open up uh, questions for the group? Um, sure, uh, I keep typing them in so far, but I'll start with Harmon who has said, are there still options for performance-based bonuses? If not, how does that work for people who truly excel? It's so funny, we're having this conversation right now at, at, at the quarterly because it's a media company. And what, what I didn't realize, may, many of you may, the publishing world you know, functions very much on an incentive-based, you know, ad sales, all that, that whole side of the house has an assumption about you pay for performance. And of course, the editorial side is people like me that come from nonprofits and, you know, with the bonuses, that sounds weird, you know? So we, in, our, in our own organization, we grapple with, well, how do we have a cohesive culture when certain parts of our organization are more, you know, traditionally motivated or have been, have been financed that way? Um, I, what I would say is that you have to articulate the why and it has to be transparent. So if as an organization you feel, or a company, you feel that bonuses work, that's my, my first question is, do they work? Are you getting better performance <laughs> because you do that? And I, I would really ask that question. I mean, and I would, I would even ask the people, would you rather just have a, a higher base salary? <laughs> you know, would you, in fact, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, a, first of all, is to say, does it work, right? You may think it works because people are still performing, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't perform in a different structure, right? But if it works, then it has to be transparent. And the problem with bonuses or anything discretionary like that is how open it is to bias, right? And for me, I mean, I don't like bonuses, period. I, I didn't use them because to me, it is inherently biased to decide who performed. I mean, the risk of bias is so high. Um, to me, it's better to have, we all have our goals and we have, you know, we're in the, top percentile of compensation for these roles. That, that's where I want to perform. But if, it's, if you think it works, be transparent about it and be sure that you would say, you wouldn't be sorry at all if somebody found out who got bonuses and how much. You think it would stand up to that test, that scrutiny. That's a tough test. Great, and um, so that is the, the rule of nonprofits is like, if, would you want to see this published in the newspaper on the Absolutely. front page, right? Would you want to say to the entire staff, here are the six people that got bonuses, and would you feel 100% clear that everyone would feel motivated by that? Because yes, they were the best performers. Yep. Um, okay, so Flo has an observation here. She says, um, I found, however, that many nonprofit managers believe that purpose is their only responsibility as leaders and feel threatened when other employees talk about contributing to it. Mm. That's true. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we can co-op purpose as much as we can co-op other, you know, incentives. So that's true. We have to be honest and careful, yeah. And how might somebody reorient that type of leader who feels purpose is proprietary versus collective? <laughs> hmm. Frankly, that would be a red flag for me. <laughs> I mean, that's a type of person, right? I'm not sure you can change that person. Um, but all you can continue to do is say, I'm here and I wanna make the highest contribution I can make. But the notion of, thank you for that language, proprietary purpose is disturbing. So, I mean, that, that, that would be something where you would sniff that out pretty quick. <laughs> Maybe you're not in the right place. Yeah. Okay, thank you, red flag. Um, Elaine says, is a reciprocal relationship a first step towards synergistic and co-creative relationship? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, you know, I remember, I think, Jennifer, you and I talked about this. You know, I remember in the first half of my career, people would say, we don't create jobs for people. Write the job description and then find the person to do that, right? And I would say that's exactly wrong, right? <laughs> you know, once we bring someone into the company or the agency, then we find out. And this is what I said in the article. It's a process of finding out who are you, what strengths do you have, you know, where are we as an organization or company, and we will figure out together what your highest contribution is, right? So that I love the notion of synergistic. It, you absolutely can't assume or predict what someone's contribution is going to be. I mean, any of you on this call who were at a company or organization or government for you know, more than five years, your roles completely transformed because you learned the organization, you learned what you had to contribute, and hopefully the organization continued to rename your job as you, as you found your contribution, right? That's, that's what we do, that's reciprocity. Who are you? You're staying invested. Let's keep figuring out how to get everything that you want to give. Um, so we don't have any more questions right now. So please type your questions if you have them. And in the meantime, I do have one. Um, Jean, you had talked about this notion of development and mutual development staying coupled because the organization's going to change, the people are going to change while we're, we're, they're there. So what have you seen as developmental best practices to help um, the employees stay connected and in tune and, and grow, right? Yeah. Well, the first thing I think is, you know, here's another old adage, right? We will pay for your professional development if it serves your current job. You have to prove. Remember these forms? I mean, I, there were forms like this where you would have to say, I want to go to this thing and I can prove to you that it's useful to my current job. Can you imagine? Uh, so that, that's what we're telling people is that the only thing that matters to us is if you can do what, you're, what we ask you to do as well as possible, right? So to me, the developmental piece is to understand what is this person interested in? What is interesting to them about this company? And to invest in where they're going, not just where they are, right? And, and when you do that, you know, not surprisingly, people stay because they know that they're not confined to a job description. I think job descriptions maybe, maybe, one of the most harmful unintended consequences uh, kind of you know, process that we have and how much time we spend getting exactly what this person is supposed to do and therefore we are going to develop them exactly to these seven deliverables. It's not how adults work. It's not how people develop. Yeah. Can you also speak about the, um, the creating the culture, perhaps, of a uh, learning organization? I just sent my, and they I think it's five more. We need to mute. Um, okay. Yeah. Like this residency. This. Can you mute? Uh, there you go. Um, Jean. Yes. I think Elizabeth had a follow-up question, and I, I do have a follow-up question to her follow-up question. So. She was talking about culture, I think. Yeah, so, I, you know, that's everything, right? And so what, what leaders, whoever they are, positional, people who have power in the organization, there's a thing called a learning organization, right? I mean, this is, there's literature on this, there's, and we know this contributes to impact. So to me, the first thing is to say that we are a learning organization. We, the, the number one thing we want you to do is be here and learn. And learn in the context of our organizational purpose. So to me, that, that's the first thing you do is what's everybody learning? You know, I mean, that's what meetings are about. That's what professional development, quote unquote, is about. It's not a vertical, it's a horizontal, right? What are we learning as an organization? That's the culture that has to be set, right? And not containing people, but actually supporting their expansion. Um, that's a great point, Jean. So one of my favorite quotes is, leaders don't create followers, they create other leaders. Yes. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and can I, you know, follow up on that? When we're talking about this, we're talking about the necessity of creating uh, collaborative problem solving groups, right? As opposed to traditional hierarchical models. We're bringing people in because we do have work that needs to be done. We think they can help us with that. They've agreed to help us with that. But things happen that we need problems happen. The whole point of what we're doing is to solve problems. So we're talking about empowering people to collaboratively problem solve and creating a culture where it's collaborative as opposed to dictatorial, correct? Or do you want to speak to that? Yes, and I, but I think I'm sure all of us on this, in this conversation, we have to reckon with hierarchy. I, I don't think we, we want absence of hierarchy. We want clear and purposeful hierarchy. There are people who are newer to a thing, have less mastery. That's a fact, right? And so we have to, to me, it's not about, I, I wasn't on your flattening conversation. I, I have to go back and listen to that recording, but we, we tried um, Holacracy at Compass Point for a couple of years. And what I, one of the things I remember about the consultant who helped us was he kept saying, this is not an absence of hierarchy. It's not. There are positions that have more power, right? It's a process for engaging people differently and acknowledging power. That's what we don't do in mainstream organizations or companies. We don't acknowledge the power, right? We just, it's sort of assumed. To me, it's not, it, there is power. We need power in organizations. The question is, is it purposely structured and do you acknowledge what it's for and when it's used? That's what I think we're looking for in a humanistic organization. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, I want to get to Michael Pearson's question because to me, this is the, the, the uh, elephant in the room. Um, how much do you think the narrative of business schools uh, and MBA education, corporate management weigh on nonprofit leaders and practices? Well, I think we spent a good 20 years trying to be for profits. <laughs> we, 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 you know, the, the, the consulting, the nonprofit, you know, consulting industry grew up around how do we, how do we make these organizations more efficient? Um, how do we teach, you know, how do we use business practices to, to, to be more efficient? Um, you know, I, I would say that I hope that nonprofits can be a lab for exploring reciprocity. Um, they don't have shareholders. They don't, there are certain things they don't have that they can experiment in a way that um, other places can't. Um, but I would agree that absolutely that message got, you know, those messages came in really hard, you know, and philanthropy was part of that. And, you know, a whole set of reasons that created that situation. I hope we would see it now as, we take what we want, but leave the rest behind and, and actually our labs for what's the next vision of how any kind of a company is, is structured and can function well. And we have more permission to do that, so we should be doing it. Okay, um, and on a related note, um, Erica Steckler is asking, um, how should business schools be teaching its undergraduate and MBA students or how should trainers be working with managers and, and employees to experiment with and model reciprocity? Are there exercises or workshop activities that you have found to be successful in helping transition um, organizations to a reciprocity paradigm? Well, one of the most accessible and really, frankly, mainstream tools that I like is Strengths. I, I, have you guys talked about Strengths Finder in this group? The Gallup, the Gallup tool. I mean, that's a, that's as mainstream as it gets, and it's as data driven as it gets. It's millions of people have taken that 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 uh, assessment. It's not a, it's not a test. To me, if we can just move from deficit risk management approach to asset based, who are you? What do you bring? That's a huge transformation. And so, to me, that 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 would be enough if everybody <laughs> took the Strengths Finder tool or something like it and said, "Oh, this is this is how I show up to this. This is what I contribute." And if our, if our systems and our organization were meant to notice that, see you, and bring you into work that, that leverages those strengths, I mean, that's it, right? Everybody has their top five strengths, everybody. Many people are in the wrong job <laughs> because they're not actually in the job that would, would leverage their strengths. So to me, it's the baseline thing is moving from how do you control this asset 
to how do you understand this asset and get it in the right space. Um, and that builds on something that Flo says. She asked a question, how have you found, or have you found that relationships are less extractive in horizontal organizations? I've worked in one where it was supposed to be the case, but I found that the absence of official leadership led to cliques, cliques and relationships based on personal affinities, which then affected people um, not answering their emails and, and when they didn't mm -hmm. like them as much. Well, I agree. That's what I mean. I, I'm I, I'm not a proponent of no hierarchy. I'm a proponent of articulated hierarchy. Why do we need this? What are the decisions that have to go up? Why why is that better for us? We've tried it this way. I, I, in all seriousness, if you articulate, there are some decisions that really can be consensus decisions, and there are some that aren't. Just because it's not how human beings work, so I, I would go more to the articulated hierarchy than a complete flatness, because there is no complete flatness. Again, flatness pretends that everybody has equal power, right? I mean, this is what we learned at Compass Point when we when we did holacracy. The holacracy, with all due respect, you know, comes out of tech. It comes out of agile, right? It, it has an assumption that we're all twenty-eight year old white men trying to get rich. Well, it turns out that wasn't what we were. <laughs> you know, you need systems and processes that actually support people, right? Uh, and so that hierarchy is support. If we think of it as infrastructure, what is the most useful infrastructure for our, our company? Um, that's great, Jean. Um, we don't have any other questions right now. Jennifer, do you want to uh, ask some? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have several. Um, and it has to do, I think, with the structures and getting into the practicality, because I agree with you. I used to work in um, a matrix organization, and we absolutely mm -hmm. had structure, otherwise we couldn't have functioned together. And, you know, it, everybody had authority over their own piece, but there were people who had a, a final authority over some decisions that that couldn't be made collaboratively. So, you know, I agree with you on that. Um, I think what I wanna get into is kind of the practicality, like if you were going to build um, a reciprocally engaged work team with structure, you know, what are those pieces? You know, if we don't have a job description, how do we help people get oriented to and, working on work that we need done because it's not that work doesn't need to get done and it's not that we can't articulate the work that needs to be done but what does it look like if we're not using um if we're trying to build a reciprocal structure the the thing that i that changed me about holacracy and again i'm not in, endorsing it or not but i'm saying that you know we we took a deep dive into it and i learned a lot it speaks right to your question and we won't ever go back is roles not jobs roles roles we need somebody who loves social media who's going to manage our twitter right that's a role there's there's somebody in the organization who's already primed to do that right who, who's great at it and it's not necessarily somebody who's also going to be the communications director and so to me, the, the way we start is by saying, what are your strengths? As I said in the article, what are you already doing? What are you already learning? You exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? you know, when you come into the organization, you already have, you're already in some process of professional development and you already have certain strengths and appetites, right? So a role is different than a job. A role is, as you said, Jennifer, we need this done. This is part of our problem. Do you have the strengths an appetite to do that. Um, and so what happens in that kind of a model is roles get defined, which is extremely empowering and actually visibilizes the work that people do. To, to give you an example, I was, I was running a, you know, a, a training and consulting organization. When you take the office manager job and break it down and you get to the role of greeter, the first person that our, our customers and clients meet with and you articulate that role and you say, we need somebody who's going to be here at eight, who's going to be excited to meet these people and you visualize that work, it gets valued and done. 
And that's much more valuable than saying it's one of the 15 responsibilities of the office manager. The role is actually our front line to our customers, right? And we define that role and visibilize it. So that, to me, that's how you begin to you know, understand what you're asking of people and also visibilize the work that they're doing. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to Michael Pearson right now. He has a question. Um, Michael, I unmuted you. So do you want to ask Jean a question? Oops, uh, yes, well, Jean, thank you for doing this. Um, sure. and I'm just uh, looking at potential examples that we can point students to that where the reciprocal <laughs> management approach is working well. Uh, anything that you can share with us, maybe other organizations that we might want to invite on this kind of conversations or, or see where and how we can learn from them. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think this is sector specific, unfortunately. You know, I, I don't think nonprofits actually do have a, a leg up here. I think we're in kind of uncharted territory. So I, I would say that, um, that there's more literature, I think, about for-profits. I think the danger there, though, is, again, the power and sort of race and, and consciousness, right? So I think what the nonprofit sector can bring to this discussion of flattening and all of this is, yeah, but we're not all the same people and there are dynamics going on in organizations. So I have more literature from for-profits, but I think that literature tends to be apolitical um, and I think that's problematic. Uh, because it means that it's it's you know what I'm saying it, it, it's working for with a certain set of assumptions that don't work for everybody <laughs> um, so I think that's where we're kind of on the leading edge is we can talk about flattening um, but we need to also talk about you know identity and power but do you have organizations to point us to like I mean gore is typically an example then there are uh, I mean we had Morningstar we had others in, in some way which which would you point to so people can learn from them and just say this is not fantasy because that's I, I think, think it's mostly in that sort of teal organization you know dialogue that that's where I see most of the dialogue but again for me personally that dialogue tends to be apolitical so I just have a little asterisk on it in terms of how that's going to work in truly multiracial and you know spaces um, but I'm you know I, I when I read that stuff I, I you know it, it resonates for me I mean does it resonate for you guys yeah I mean that's why we're here <laughs> yeah but I, it, but it's mostly for-profit examples right and I, I do think there still tends to be not enough attention paid to how diverse adults actually manage through those systems and can I back to our, you know people need support they need support, they need infrastructure. And so what we're talking about is deconstructing some of that traditional infrastructure. We have to be very careful who that serves, right? And, and, and what supports alternatively need to be in place. And that, that's, the, that's what I mean by the asterisks is that the, the, most of those systems assume a level of e equality, not equity, right? Right, and then I, I want to follow up and kind of dive into this. One of the questions we got on the, the registrations had to do with someone who works as a, at, at a person of color led organization and um, you know, they associate extractive work relationships with white dominant work culture. And I do think that we have, to, that we should be having conversations about um, how to create how to help diverse work groups become more cohesive while not while recognizing the inherent issues that come with the power dynamics at play in in those relationships as we walk into the room right, um, right. can you talk about that at all in terms of um, how how can we help create re truly reciprocal relationships um, in in situations where you know our biases might be working against us well you know again it's it, and every company has to decide this on their own I, as a nonprofit person I would probably take more we go more in this direction but the bottom line is what is the work and to me was you know work is partly about creating change and so we have to recognize where people are in their own change process at work in my opinion 
again, traditional systems treat everybody the same, right? And again, it's equality versus equity, right? They treat everybody the same. They assume everybody is going to be able to show up to this space in the exact same way with the exact same power. It's not true. It's simply not true. And so we have to build into our process some acknowledgement of who are you, where are you in your process of understanding this company, finding your way in this company, making your contribution in this company. If we run meetings and processes as if everybody has the same answer to that question, which is what we do, how, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. There's 15 people in this room and they all are in a different journey, a different place in their journey with understanding what we're doing, what their value is, et cetera. So to me, it's about building that knowledge into all processes, not treating everybody the same. Right? Not assuming that everybody's coming into the meeting in the same way. They're not. And I just want to say again, that's also, it's, it's values, but you're not getting productivity that way. When you treat everybody the same, you're, you're pitching to the middle. I mean, you're, everybody isn't the same. So you're not getting production that you need. You're simply not. Um, I want to ask a question on behalf of Elaine, who raises something I think is super important. Um, do reciprocal relationships require a level of personal development, such as green, if you're using uh, Wilbur's integral model, of, uh, 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 or pluralism uh, versus um, you know, somebody who may have a different worldview about being um, more egoistic? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, I, I think, I, again, you can opt out of this, but this is what we do as human beings. We create companies, we create organizations, we create value propositions. If you don't think that that requires <laughs> uh, self-reflection and continuous learning, you know, I would say, I'd argue that you're wrong. Yeah. But will you encounter people like that? Of course, you know. Uh, but yes, I think, I mean, taking on the responsibility of leading anything, a team, a project, uh, you know, an organization means I have to figure out what my stance is towards this process. What is my stance towards having leadership power? Okay. Um, real quick, I want to, we're getting, we have about a little over 10 minutes left. If you are looking to get a certificate of completion, um, you can get an HRCI, a SHRM, and or a general certificate. So make sure you put it in the chat room. We need your name as you want it on the certificate, your email, so I can email it to you in which certificates you want, either HRCI, SHRM, or gen, uh, and or general. You can have all three if you want. Um, but put that in the chat room. Elizabeth? Um, now I'm going to ask a question for, from Ravi, and it's a little bit um, long, so uh, bear with me. Um, this relates to the concept of synergies, and there are three types of synergies, sequential, pooled, and reciprocal. In sequential synergies, you recreate something and pass it on to the next for further value creation. In pooled synergies, one contributes to a pool of value, creating competencies to create a greater good. In reciprocal synergies, there is a clear quid pro quo or different assets for greater good. Um, is, if you're, is your view limited to synergies? What's your point of view regarding the type of reciprocity comes as a, a spectrum, I think is his point. So Yeah, uh, that's a lot. But I, I mean, I would say that, and I think I said this in the article, that when you look at a high performing, quote unquote, employee what are you seeing what are you seeing the fact of the matter is you're seeing an enormous amount of intrinsic motivation towards an identified purpose right so to me that's the center that's the synergy i'm talking about it's just not a it's it's just simply untrue that you're going to get performance other than that right i mean the high performance has to do with intrinsic motivation tied to company purpose um, so that's the synergy I'm talking about. And, and well, I think that a lot of human resources is risk management oriented and corrective as opposed to the fact of the matter is when people are just crushing it, it's because they're intrinsically motivated and they understand the purpose. Um, and Georgia raises a great point. She says, I have a feeling that very often you get more red flag managers than you would hope for, um, especially in the for-profit private sector. Um, are we always in the wrong job? Because uh, you know, we can't all change our jobs, right? Um, are we always, uh, wh why is it that the bad leader manager thinks is so, so important? Maybe he or she is in the wrong job and how can we bring the change? Yeah. 
And I think this gives you idea of maybe, you know, Maslow's idea of organizations becoming places of healing, um, where they could help people develop and, and all of us self-actualize, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, power is an interesting thing. When, when we have power under, right, when, when we have theoretically less power, for those of you who have been positional leaders, uh, so I was an executive director, for instance, there's enormous power under I mean, what the executive director is thinking about, whether you like the way they're thinking or not, is constantly, what are these people doing? What are they thinking? What are they, did this work, right? So there's enormous power in the under, right, as well. And so the question, not that it's, you know, fair necessarily, but the fact of the matter is, there's enormous power there. How do you put the right pressure on the system, right? How do you articulate what the system means? For me personally, it's about articulating from an organizational standpoint. I mean, that's what I think works is when you say, I think we could be more effective if we had this kind of a meeting or this, you know, as opposed to just speaking from the self. Now, that's just my opinion. I, I think that people, but th th this is a uh, chicken or the egg though, because people are cut off from organizational strategy. So they're unable to articulate their needs in the context of organizational impact. And that's the problem, right? That, that's the chicken or the egg. When we silo people out, they can't make a good argument for what needs to change. And that's part of the, that's, that's power over, right? Um, Michael Pearson raises an excellent question, and maybe this is your next project, Jean. Um, what then are the practices that can be standardized, and how can you, we create sort of a blueprint or a template of course, it would need to be adaptive based on context, right? But some basic principles that can help organizations make these changes. Well, let's start with the whole job announcement and onboarding process. Let's, let's really interrogate the beginning of the relationship. If we're, seeing, if we're saying that we're going to be in relationship with adults, living, existing adults who already have lives, who already have intelligence, who already have networks, and we're going to bring them into our organization, to me, we could do amazing work if we revisit that whole process of how we announce a job, how we select somebody, how we contract with them based on who they actually are, right? That we are malleable enough to say, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't know we were also getting X strength. You know, we, we, we had a, a job position. <laughs> we, we announced it. We interviewed all these people. We found you, you, you know. You, Jennifer Hancock, you happen to also bring these things. So let us know that and recognize that in our first six months, find out what is literally your highest contribution here, not just what we you know, bargained for. So I think if we reshape that whole process of building the relationship, then we're on the path to actually working with this person as an individual and, and having them give everything they can give. Okay. Um, Michael, uh, did that answer your can question? I just follow up on um, this kind of goes into a conversation Jean and I had a couple of weeks ago about how nonprofits onboard and we tend to onboard by recruiting in a bunch of volunteers and providing orientation and training and then we help them figure out where in the organization they're going to be the best fit right. Um, and it's a little, it's very different from the way uh, for profits on board, but I think that's what you were trying to get to, right, Jean? Absolutely. Yeah, but I, I just think that reciprocity is about flexibility, right? It's about recognizing who's there and who we are right now. And to me, the way organizations innovate is by actually maximizing the intelligence of who's in the system at that time. And, and most of our systems don't do that. And contain and confine, right? Well, we don't want to contain and confine. We want to know you're here, who you are, what strengths you have. We want to get them right now, <laughs> right now. We don't need to wait for your promotion or your, you know, your performance review. <laughs> who are you? What do you have to bring? You know, that, a system that can respond to that and react to that is going to be, in my opinion, inherently more innovative than one that says, don't do that. We didn't ask you to do that. And uh, Elizabeth, I think we have about five minutes left. So, um, and if you need a certificate of completion, make sure to put it in the chat room. Elizabeth, do we have any other questions? I'm looking, I'm scrolling at the chat. The, the, it's getting, um, everybody's sending in their certificate requests. So um, let's see. 
Um, Elizabeth, you wanted me to, to follow yeah. up? Oh, okay. Well, I, Jean, so that's the, the onboarding process. What else is there? Because you said the strategizing process. You said many other sort of kind of processes in which people sort of need to be more participatory and, and yet we need to honor the, the hierarchical sort of power differentials. In what way, I'm asking specifically for our organization here maybe. We're a virtual-based organization. How can you do these kind of things, uh, potentially in these kind of organizations that are volunteer based uh. yeah well I mean in addition to onboarding I would go back to my point about strategy and maybe I didn't say this about money as well I, I think that strategy and money are the two things that keep people from understanding what's going on and therefore giving their best right and they're and even growing right so the, the two things that the information that people need to be in a reciprocal relationship has to do with organizational strategy and money so the first thing that I would do is democratize that information. Everybody, everybody should understand strategy and money inside a system. Everybody. I mean, I really, I mean, I'm really being serious. The receptionist, the you know, and you don't have receptionists because you're virtual, but you know what I'm saying. Everybody has to understand what we're doing and how we pay for it. And once everybody understands that then they can participate in a reciprocal way. They can figure out, well, what's my contribution to that? As long as we keep people away from those two pieces of information, they are going to sort of think about it as a job. How do I get to my next place? How do I, they have to understand the reason and the money. And so, again, I would reorient all of orientation onboarding to do, I don't care what your job is. This is what we're doing and this is how we get paid. You have to understand that no matter what you do here, <laughs> that's the only way you're going to make a contribution. Great, thank you. So yeah. we're, do, do we have any more questions? We've got like three minutes left. So I think we have time for one question and then let's wrap it up. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and ask, do you, were there any more that came in from the chat? Uh, no, no, okay. I mean, Excuse me, the registration. Oh, um, yeah, but I think we covered most of the most of the topics. You know, I think if we could just recap what the three takeaways are, right? If someone is going to take this to the organization, what are the three areas? You said it was how we onboard um, the strategies so people understand what the business of the business is, not just I'm here to open up an envelope and process a payment, but what am I processing really? Um, if you can kind of recap the three most important things you want people to take away from our conversation. Yeah. Well, the first one is the mindset, the philosophy, as you said, the mindset that these end of these adults, you know, these, these human beings, right, are intersecting with the organization. The organization is always changing and people are always changing, right? And that, that intersection is what we're talking about is when do these people come into this system and how do they make their highest contribution? So to me, our systems need to recognize that dynamism and appreciate you know, philosophically that these people are on their own journey. This organization is on its journey. They're gonna intersect. How do we make that the best marriage possible? It's temporary, right? So that's sort of philosophically. But then secondly, I think we start by the whole idea of how we describe jobs, how we recruit, how we build relationship, what we acknowledge about people, how we're willing to change in that onboarding process to meet the strengths of that person, that, that, that's a whole piece of it, right? And then thirdly, as you said, is the democratization of information. The only way to be reciprocal is for me to know what you know. If I don't know that, I can't be reciprocal. And that creates power over that doesn't, in my opinion, develop people or even get the productivity you need. So the information has to be democratized for there to be a reciprocal relationship. Well, thank you very much. And I, I love that last bit. Um, you know, the organization I was in that managed to do a matrix organization, it was because we democratized the information. We made all the information that everybody had available to everyone through a system so that everybody could contribute to that. Um, thank you again, Jean, for joining us. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I wish we had more time. Um, again, this was, 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the International Humanistic Management Association. We're online at humanisticmanagement.international. Um, we do have several of these sorts of uh, conversations we do every month. So be sure to join our mailing list if you're not already on it, um, and also become a member so that we can afford to do these things. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. Take care.